Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm back again with my guest, Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy, welcome back to Toolbox. Thanks. Glad to be here. It's, it's awesome to have you, and it's almost like we never left the studio, <laughs> or we wear the same thing all the time. That's right. This is the only, I actually have a closet full of hangers that have nothing but the Azure logo shirts on them. That so is amazing. The cat's out of the bag. There you go. So we, we, we're doing two episodes today, but they'll be published separately, so folks might have not even seen the previous episode. That's totally fine. Uh, so today we're going to really focus down on Cosmos DB, right? Absolutely. Cool. So what are we going to talk about? Give us a, give us a summary. So I, I want to just drill into a lot of the aspects of Cosmos DB. I've gotten pretty excited about it. In the other episode, we talked about a link shortening tool that mm -hmm. I used. Yeah. And I enhanced that tool to store data into Cosmos DB so I could find insights from my application. Mm -hmm. and what I found is just, it, you know, it works incredibly. It works really well. As a .NET developer, there are a lot of ways to interface with it. So I want to talk about, you know, what Cosmos DB is, why it's important to .NET developers, and show a little bit about how to get plugged into Cosmos DB and start using it as a service. Right. And you know, folks didn't see our previous episode, that's fine. We'll link it. It's not a dependency right. or anything. You no, showed a cool Azure function thing and you know, that was a really good thing to watch if folks are interested. But let, let's start with what Cosmos DB is. Again, I want to make sure folks coming in maybe really not, not knowing what this database technology is all about. If you can give us a quick summary, that'd be great. Sure. So uh, you know, when we talk about functions, we talk about serverless, which mm -hmm. I, I talked about flipping that less server. Yeah. Cosmos DB is what functions are to compute. Cosmos DB is to storage. Right. It's the idea of sort of a hands-free ability to host an enterprise-grade database. Right. It's so NoSQL, right? I mean, that's, it, it, that's kind of the defining way to describe it right. at a baseline, and then it has a lot more because of what we built into it. Right. So it, it's NoSQL. It's, it's document-based. But what's neat about it is it supports a bunch of different interfaces to connect to it. Mm -hmm. One of those interfaces is what everyone who has followed the history is familiar with document DB. Right. So that was the previous incarnation. And what's interesting about document DB is it supports SQL syntax. So even though in the database we're storing documents that can have different schemas and properties, I can still go to my comfortable select star from group by order by and use that familiar syntax to query the database. Mm -hmm. If, however, I'm a traditional NoSQL developer and I'm used to something like MongoDB, we have a MongoDB driver that works out of the box. In fact, I can take an existing MongoDB application, update the connection string, and connect to Cosmos DB and use that. Yeah, that's very cool. And then there's two other APIs. There's a table storage API, mm -hmm. which again, you update the connection string. Your app that uses table storage is completely transparent. And then there's one that I always love to bring up this interface name because it's called Gremlin, right? Gremlin. Okay. So Gremlin is what we call a, a graph interface and the idea is that you're storing nodes and vertices that connect the nodes and the canonical example is airports mm -hmm. so you have airports as nodes and then there's flight paths that connect them and gremlin right. is a a language that can describe how to traverse those paths and then find information things like what's the shortest path what is aggregate information along the path etc oh, that's really cool and for folks that you know might might be googling later on, trying to find some information about uh, about this product, the, the rename is always like a, a moment in time with Microsoft, and it changes <laughs> something sure. like that. So to be clear, like Document DB was what this product was called. Right. It's now called Cosmos DB, but we still refer to Document DB interface, right? Of the way the way we you can interact with it. Right. Um, but that that that's just a historic factor, right? Of what it was called. So the name might be dead from the product name perspective, but it's still alive from a interface perspective. It, it is still alive. In fact, I did a, a workshop that was a, a Node workshop based on Mongo or based on Document DB, mm -hmm. and of course it's iterated now to Cosmos DB. So I created Cosmos DB and was able to migrate that existing application without changing code. I just updated the connection string, yeah. and that existing Document DB driver worked you know, as is, out of the box. Yeah, so. yeah we, we changed the name because it was honestly just causing confusion. I remember the conversation. Folks right. didn't realize the power of this technology, and hopefully the, the new name gives it some new new life. And It's uh, a lot more fun, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I was impressed. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't pick the best names. I'm I'm in marketing, so I've, I've spent time br naming stuff. You you can blame me for CodeLens, for example. Oh, you, okay. you can praise me or blame me. I was on that project. CodeLens. Uh, but yeah, this, this was a good one. I, I like uh, Cosmos DB, and uh, let's jump in to see what, what it's all about. Sure. So the first thing I'm going to show you just from the portal is the experience of creating 
a new Cosmos mm -hmm. DB. I'm not going to sure. go all the way through it because I have an existing one. But if you click into add a new resource and just pick Cosmos DB, it's going to ask me for an account ID. So mm -hmm. this is just a unique identifier right. to access the like, database. Like most Azure resources, there's some URL, and that URL needs an, a unique identifier in the beginning. You can always change it, kill it later, but. Right. So we'll do My VS Toolbox DB. Mm -hmm. And then you pick your API. This is what we were talking about. It supports different ways to interface. The yeah. traditional document DB, mm -hmm. the MongoDB interface, the Gremlin or Graph interface, and then key value storage, table, simple storage. So we can pick any one of these. Let's just do table storage. I pick my subscription. That's my billing. I can create a new resource group. I pick my location. And then I can enable geo redundancy. What this is key because this is going to give me the ability off a map to basically click different regions and have it automatically span those regions for me, which is yeah. a pretty cool feature. Yeah, for, for what, what I often hear people describe this technology of ours uh, as a gl globally distributed database, you know, something that can live in lots of data centers, and I believe you mentioned there's different kind of retention policies, right, of how, how much replication you need, what kind of concurrency you need, all of that stuff. Right. Exactly. Cool. In fact, this is one that I've created, and this is a live one that I'm using for my link shortening tool, and it stores metadata. And you can see that for my purposes, because I'm the only one who's actually exploring the data, yeah. I just have this in, in uh, the Atlanta region, which is mm -hmm. close to me, the eastern US. I've got an activity log that'll show me how it's been accessed, so I can quickly look at you know, basically, have there been any errors or issues or anything along those lines? And this is just basic, you know, what's available in Azure by default. You, you didn't configure any of this telemetry, Co Correct. For this is completely out of the box. What's really nice with this is the, the data explorer. Mm. And this allows me to look at my collections, which are containers of, of documents. They're kind of the, yeah. the corollary of tables, if someone's used to relational databases. You can see I have these URL stats. And this is using a SQL-like syntax, select star from, from C. And it's giving me IDs so that I can expand these on demand. So if I click on one of these, you can see the actual document that's stored. In this case, there's a unique identifier. It redirected to a page, has a timestamp. And this particular document was a Facebook redirect. Cool. If I click on another one, though, this is the, the power of Cosmos DB and document databases is this one has a property called Twitter. Yeah. So I'm not locked into a specific schema. I'm counting different types of, of items for that. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a great power. I mean, as, as a person that's used to creating a table, you know, back in the SQL world and having that table be sort of the, the definition of what, you, what kind of data you can store, um, th this is a different way of thinking about it, right, in right. terms of NoSQL. Well, and, and here's what's really nice. I want to jump into some code and show an example project that I created. But what I love about the way that both the document DB and the MongoDB interfaces are written is developers used to SQL are also pretty used to object relational mappers. Yeah. It's a, you know, Entity Framework is, is a very popular one. And the whole idea is I deal with my code and classes. The database stores them as relational tables, so I need something to, to map between the two of those. What's nice when you take a document approach is even though the document is schema list and you can have open data and you could do you know, a dictionary key value pair to set the document, yeah. you can also create strongly typed classes and you don't need to go through any intermediary to store them. The driver just accepts that class as is and stores it right into the database. Cool. Let's take so, a look. So if we, we take a look, and I'm going to come back to the, the link shortener in a second, but I've got a, a Visual Studio Code window opened here. And in this project, what I did was took the USDA food database and imported it into Cosmos DB and then stood up an application so you can search food items. Cool. And if we look at these links in the configuration, I'm going to just click on this food group link. You can see the way it's stored actually on the website is this format of these weird squiggly lines and, and arrows and, and whatnot. So part of what this application does that I won't spend too much time on, it says a parser. And that parser is going to read the lines in and split them up. Cool. And then it has an importer that actually imports the collection. The transformer is how it maps them to this is a food group item or, or something different. 
but the importer, this, this is the actual code that I'm using to populate the database. Mm -hmm. And you can see that we have a helper method that gets our, our database connection. So we're pulling in our secrets, making right. a connection. Then what I love about this is I have git collection. So I'm getting a collection of a particular type. It might be food group, food item, something like that. If that collection exists because this is the import utility, I'm going to drop it and recreate it so I can just import fresh. This is the code that inserts an item. And that's all there is to it. This item is passed in. You can see this is a generic type of T. So the item might be a food group class, and I'm going to show those in a second. But literally, collection, insert one async. Ooh. And that loads it into the, the database for me. I've got a completely separate project that has my models, my classes. So here's food group, for instance. This could be a completely POCO, right? Plain old yeah. C-sharp object, CLR object, if you will. But I've chosen to go ahead and, and add some metadata that says, OK, this is a unique identifier. Right, so you use an attribute to, to make code the right. BSO and ID. And uh, you know, some people might want to do this fluently, so keep it out of the class completely. And you can do that. Yeah. But for the purpose of this demo, we did metadata. The other with thing- great power and flexibility <laughs> comes great responsibility. Exactly. <laughs> with great powers, great responsibility. The other thing I wanted to show, and, and this is a nuance, and I think it's important to call out because this is what people run into when they move from that relational model to the document model. The first time I decided to create a food item, what happens is every food item in the database has a set of nutrients. And that can be protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamin C, whatever. Right. The database doesn't necessarily have all nutrients for all foods. So I may have a food that only has three. I may have a food that has 200. Right. So the way we would typically model that in a C-sharp class is just like this, right? I have a nutrient and I have an array of nutrients, which is straightforward. The problem, though, is when it stores that in the document database, it's just an array that can have whatever inside of it, because yeah, remember, number this is schema, schema yeah. So if I wanted to ask a question like, what are the foods with the top protein content, it would have to go into each one of those mm, records, right. scan the array, find the entry, and pull that out. Right. It becomes a very intensive operation to complete right. because of the distributed nature of the data. So what I'm going to do is search for this uh, Cosmos database that I have preloaded so that I can show you exactly what the data looks like inside the database. And once again, I have this experience that I can go into the Data Explorer. I can expand my collections. And here you see I have food groups, nutrient definitions, and food right. items. The way this is stored in the database, and we'll pull up this document, you can see that I have an array of weights, which is fine. But this nutrient doc has nutrients, and then water here is a property. Mm -hmm. It's not an entry in an array. This is nutrient doc dot nutrients dot water or dot nutrients dot energy. Mm -hmm. So now I'm referencing just a path on the document, right. and I can do that indexing. I still want to be able to work with it as an array from C sharp. Yep. So all I had to do for that is just put a helper method that basically when we pull it from the database, we look at this free form document format, that's mm -hmm. this nutrient doc, and build up our strongly typed list of nutrients. And then on the flip side, when we're saving, we just go through our strongly typed list of nutrients and create a, a more loose form JSON type document. Yeah, so yeah, this makes sense. I mean, I've seen this kind of pattern before and like processing XML, in some cases you wind up in a very similar, like some other systems XML data, right? And you're converting it into some structured thing. Right. In your, your database and there, the way they've organized it doesn't make sense for you as a, as a query, you know, performant thing. And you have to reorganize it. So. Right. So that will actually map in. And I want to show the, the simple case of mm -hmm. accessing this data now. Yeah. So I showed the experience of importing it. I've got a little test application. And this is just making sure that I have my connection set up correctly. So you can see here, this is the power of .NET Core, right? We've got a very flexible configuration model. I can have my keys stored in app settings. Mm -hmm. I personally don't want to check those in and have someone steal secrets. Yeah. So in Secret this case, I've set environment variables. And you can see here, it'll pull from the JSON unless it's overridden by the environment. Cool. And then those secrets come in. And when we deploy this into a website, we can always set them up in the application settings. Right. 
So it's very flexible like that. This is getting the list of groups, and this is the code. This is using the MongoDB driver. It's basically getting the name of the collection, that's just a helper I have, as queryable to a list. This is link syntax that everyone should be familiar with. Yep. Looks a lot like Entity Framework, only I don't have to add that as an intermediary. Yeah, so if you're a .NET developer, all of this is like being home, you know, nothing, right. nothing, nothing unusual. So it just iterates the groups and writes them, and then here we're going to grab the first food item. So again, it's getting that collection as queryable, first or default. And yeah. then I just pull some information out. So let's uh, take a look at that from my terminal and run it. Let me see where I'm at. I'm in the console test. And of course, this is .NET. You can just do the .NET build release and it'll come through. And in this case, I've got a helper for connecting to Cosmos DB, mm -hmm. and I share my models between several projects. So you can see it built the models, the connector, mm -hmm. and now it built the test. So let's run that, that test project really quickly. So we'll go, and this is USDA console test.dll. And so it's going through the connection string, getting that list of food items. It's listed it out. And then I, I tap that, and it grabs that last food item for me. Cool. So we know it's working. The next logical step in most applications is to build a web API. So I've got this web API, and this is where the scenario that I talked about with, you know, give me the top nutrients comes into play. If I want to mm -hmm. sort, for example, from protein. So if we look at the controller, and again, what I, I love about this is the .NET developers are going to be just very familiar with this type of syntax. So here I'm getting a specific food group. Mm -hmm. So that's my route, passes in the code. I'm going to return not found if you pass me an empty code. That's just logical, right? It's right. being safe. Now I come through and I grab that collection and here we go. Find a sync, food group where code equals code. Just link syntax, cool. straightforward. When it grabs that, I decided to enhance this as well and grab all the food items that are in that food group. So if you get that group detail, you can get a list of items and, and drill into those. Right. And then it just returns an OK result. That's it. That's the API endpoint. So if we come inside of, of this application now, let's um, actually expand this out. And Control K is the secret code to clear the screen. I did not know that. Yep. So I think there's some right click equivalent that I use. We'll go into this, and again, .NET build. We'll go to release. You can build the debug if you want. And we'll let that spin. Again, models connector being reused across projects. And then we'll do .NET, and we'll go and run this. And yeah, this one of the cool things when looking at your code is, is, like you said, it's very familiar to .NET developers. Uh, the Cosmos you know, client library that the Cosmos team builds gives you a lot of that link syntax against it. So as a .NET developer, you can come in here and be like, yeah, in, in a couple of hours, I'm, I'm building against Cosmos. I don't have to really right. learn yeah, some, some new thing. And you have your explorer in the cloud to see the data. Is it that the usual question, like my app's malfunction, is it writing the data? Is it reading the data <laughs> exactly. wrong? Exactly. So you have multiple points that are just there. Well, there's actually a, a quick start, too, that I love. Because when you build a new Cosmos DB, you can literally click a button in the portal, and it'll create a, a populated list of items mm -hmm. and give you a download for a project to hit the ground running. Cool. So it's yeah. not building it yourself, but it's yeah. having an app that you can look at and interact with. So we're going to just hit this food groups endpoint to get the list. And again, what's happening here is my API is going out, grabbing Cosmos DB. It just pulled back the list of food groups. Let's pick one of the food groups. I'm going to do 200, which is a baby product. So for the, oh, actually, spices and herbs. <laughs> So then we got this list of foods with spices and herbs. And Maybe you your, your baby likes spices <laughs> and herbs. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you. Exactly. So now that we have a database and we have an API, we have mm -hmm. everything we need to do to build a front end. Yeah, the focus cool. of this is Cosmos DB, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with the front end. But what I do want to show you is, actually, let's keep this running. And we'll open up a new terminal. And in this same project, I have a web, actual web page. It's a single page application that just uses Vue.js. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to say Angular, React, whatever. It was just a quick, You're not picking sides. quick, quick, quick way to get up and running. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is see if I have any Docker pieces running. Let's actually make sure Docker is good to go. That little detail. 
Yeah, it, it is good to have go. Docker spinning for that. It's so getting there. We'll give it a second. Yep. But what I've done is I've just created a really tiny application. You can see it's got a bunch of HTML that uses templates and data binding to do things like list nutrients and list food items. Just yeah. you know, one page of information. Yeah, there's no there's no back end code. This is all JavaScript using right. UGS. You render off the public endpoint that you've built for yep. this example. I exactly. Yeah. And for this, the the JavaScript include is just using very simple code to make calls out to the API endpoints. So we've got cool. queries and, and that actually reminds me while well, uh, Docker's spinning up, it might be done here. I wanted to show you this inside the web API for the foods controller. This is the one that allows me to do things like sort or filter by a group. So I've got from the query string, I've got a group ID, I've got a from the query string a search. And so this will come through and basically project the item. So MongoDB has something called projections where you can mm -hmm. say, even though there's this much data in the database, this is what I'm really going to show. So for subset, my UI. subset of records exactly. based on the filter of some sort. Yep, and so, uh, sounds just like Link that I'm used to, you know, entity framework and all that. Coming exactly, coming it's, it's the yeah. same thing. This should be very familiar. Mm -hmm. Description contains the search. Yep, and the food group ID equals the food group, and you can see I can chain these together, or basically do one, the other, or both. And then I go out, get the query, order it, and, and list it. So again, very straightforward in, in that sense. Let's come back and see how our Docker's doing. We'll do Docker. All right. There you go. So I'm going to run the image I created. There's a very simple Docker file that uses something called BusyBox, which is a really tiny web server because all I'm serving is an HTML page and yeah, a JavaScript a JavaScript file. page, basically. I mean, right. Yeah. So I'm going to map port 888 because port 80 is inexplic inexplicably, inexplicably taken <laughs> on my laptop. And we call this USDA web. So we run that. I'm just going to do this to make sure it's still running. It oh, looks go. good. Let's come back into our browser and hit localhost. Docker host. for dev is so powerful. I, it, it's it is. Under, undervalued sometimes. And here's my simple Vue.js app. And I can select a food group. Let's do spices and herbs. Click filter. Boom, it pulls these. And then when I click on them, it's going to give me all the nutrient information. So zinc, Very manganese, nice. vitamin C. And then as a person who eats a 100% plant-based diet, what I might be interested in is breakfast cereals, which one has the most protein? So I'm picking the group, breakfast cereals, mm -hmm. nutrient protein, give me the top foods. Look how fast that was. Yeah. It just came back sorted. And these, when I click on this, presumably it's going to have a, a higher protein. Kind of, well, actually, that's kind of <laughs> small there. But it's also a small uh, serving size. So if we change to something that has a bigger serving size, like a cup, you can see the, uh, OK, well, let's do one and a half. Let's actually take the maximum cup amount. There we go. Now <laughs> we've got good, good protein. Yeah. And then we can search with the text. So this is a fully functional app on Cosmos DB. Mm -hmm. And what's really neat is for the front end, I don't even have to care. I'm just working with straight APIs. Yeah. For the back end, I can use either Document DB driver or Mongo. Now, what I showed you in this .NET Core app mm -hmm. was the MongoDB driver. Sure. I want to take one quick second and show you what I use for my URL shortener. And that is the document DB. And what's really nice, and we talked about this in the episode with Azure Functions, is the, the fact that we have these things called bindings that make it really easy to interact with external mm -hmm. sources. Yep. There's triggers and bindings. So if I open up this project, I'm using the document DB interface to store all my information. And when I look at this function host, what I did was added this attribute for document DB. Mm -hmm. I gave it the name of the database, the name of the collection, created if it doesn't exist. I love that about bindings. The yeah. first time it calls, it can do that. And my connection string is a secret that I store in app settings so that no one else sees it. Mm -hmm. And notice I have this out dynamic doc. So remember, schema list so I can create the doc however I want. Using this API at the very end of my method, I create an expando object, which is just you know key value pair, basically, for dynamic. Mm -hmm. I'm adding a GUID to make it unique, putting the page and the count. 
And then based on the custom event, and this is if it's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, my blog, right. I add that. Notice that there's no other code. This is an out parameter, so by setting the value of the parameter when this function exits, automatically writes the document into Cosmos DB for nice. me. Now, even though Cosmos DB is a document database, I can plug it into Power BI and pull up rich metrics and data and filters. So what I've got here is where my redirects are coming from. I'm just doing one day, so I'm seeing where are the most click-throughs, what hour of the day is popular, and these are my popular links, and I can come into the filter, for example, and let's look at change this from last one day to last one month and apply the filter. And now you can see this is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so Wednesday wins for click-throughs. This uh, 4 o'clock UTC, which is around noon Eastern time, is popular mm -hmm. for clicking during time of day, and then I've got all my links here. So I get all the information I want pulled out of that Cosmos DB. Cool. Very nice. So you've got the whole story basically end to end. You've, you can store data. You have flexibility in how you query it. You've got the ability to add Power BI dashboards on top of that data. What more can people want, especially, you know, just to <laughs> give it a try? Exactly. It's working great for me. And again, on, on the site, there's plenty of quick starts that let you download the project, pre-populate the database, and get up and running in seconds. All right. Sounds good. Anything else you wanted to show about this today? Uh, that's it. Uh, everything I've, I've shown today is open source on my GitHub. We'll put the, the links yep. on the we'll site. There's the Cosmos DB that'll import the data for you from the USDA. It's got that built in, as well as the URL shortening project that I have here. All right. Well, that sounds good. And we really hope people give uh, Cosmos DB a try. And thank you so much for coming on yet again. Yeah, and thank we'll, you. We'll have you back. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And uh, again, hope folks give our technology a try. It's all we're, we're trying to show you all the coolest stuff. And uh, this is definitely some of the most cutting edge things that, that we've been working on. So glad to do it. A lot of fun. Thanks right. for having me on. I'll make sure to wear my, my Azure shirt. You next always got to wear it from now on. If you don't wear it, <laughs> you can't come on the show. Banned from the show. <laughs> all, right. all right. Thank you for watching, everybody. Have a good one.